Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to have George Bryant join us. George, welcome. Thank you, man. I'm stoked to be here. I'm, I, was, I was just like half chugging my cold coffee from three hours ago because I didn't leave myself enough space to drink it this morning, but I'm, I'm stoked to be here. There, there we go. Yeah, I called upon you at the exact moment you were you're taking a big swig. So uh, it's well like, it's like when you go, it's like when you go to restaurants, you ever notice that they, as soon as you take your first bite, they always ask you how your meal is when you're still chewing. And I was like, Oh, right. cause you don't want the real answer. You're just trying to get a drive by in right now. I can't like all is horrible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Perfect timing. Perfect. Okay. Well let's, let's get into it. So for those that aren't familiar with you and your work, uh, you're a New York times bestselling author on a very different topic than maybe some might, uh, yeah. might expect. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, you have your own podcast. You're a digital marketing consultant with a, a real expertise uh, around building and implementing customer journeys. And so I thought before we get into your story, before we kind of really get into all the, the stuff that I think people will really find helpful in terms of growing their businesses and looking at how they can make improvements, uh, just explain like what is a customer journey and yeah. why is it so powerful in the world of business? Yeah, I love this question. I love this question. And so for me, a customer journey is an intentionality of designing a journey that helps our customers achieve the desired result and understanding that the relationship doesn't end when the transaction takes place. The relationship begins and it only ends when the result has been achieved. And mm. so that's how I define customer journey. And when I think about it, I, I think about it in the lens of when I make a promise to somebody like, hey, I'm going to help you lose five pounds or double your revenue or get 80% open rates in your email, my promises don't carry any weight. They're just the wrapping paper to get them to open the present. And my true value and my, my true measure of success is not when they understand that I can do it, but when they do it for themselves and get a taste of that result, right? And it might not be five pounds, maybe it was three pounds, but a customer journey is designed to help people and give them the best chance of success at what we promised. And, and that, in my opinion, is the strongest foundational way to build a legacy business that stands the test of time. Because, you know, none of us walk up to our friends and it's like, hey, man, Mike, I'm so good to see you, buddy. You'll never believe it. I bought this course from this person and I didn't get the result, but I'm so stoked to promote it for you. Right. And and it, it's the intentionality behind it. And, and I love that people talk about it now because five years ago, everyone's like, you're nuts. What's a customer journey? That's silly. That's stupid. And now my phone's ringing off the hook. They're like, hey, man, remember that thing you told me five years ago? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, like people actually want the results that that we promise. And I feel like it's not out of ill intent that people don't do it. I feel like it's out of being a byproduct of the paradigm that's happened in marketing for the last like 10 years, right? And how fast things have moved. And in the name of the information game and information marketing and, and even product-based marketing, what ended up happening is that there was this, this shift that everybody focused so much on frontline revenue and acquisition, but they didn't realize how much they were negating their own business by creating these anti-marketing machines of people that didn't get the results or didn't use the product. And then that's a ripple that's almost unmeasurable, but when you feel it, you can't recover from it. And so it's a lot easier to build a relationship the right way, then recover from one that started the wrong way. And so that's how I see customer journey. Yeah, it's really interesting that the way that you kind of defined it and the focus that you really placed uh, around the word of customer journey is being what happens once you begin working with someone. And I think that for most people who tend to kind of think about the customer journey, their focus is more on what happens from like the marketing or the awareness or the brand building that you're doing up to the point of actually acquisition, like getting the client. Yep. Um, so that's really that's really interesting to me. Do you, I mean, the work that you do is the focus really once somebody becomes a client or are you also helping more on the acquisition part and getting something to become a client? Yeah, both, both. But where most people, and and I'm, I'm speaking in blankets and so forgive me, uh, I'm just speaking in generalities, but uh, most people start at the front and then the back is an afterthought. I start in the back and the front handles itself, yeah. right? Because like what ultimately sells confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Not confidence in your offer, confidence that someone can get the result. But if all mm -hmm. you're doing is working on an offer, then you're not going to be confident in the first place. And marketing gets really, really hard. But when I know that every hundred people that come through, they're getting results, it's really easy to market my product because I worked on that journey first. And so 
they're both equally important. But when we think about it, like I always use like monogamous romantic relationships, right? Because in the lens of this, it, it sounds like, oh yeah, we should do this. And I was like, yes, but you would never date somebody, get engaged. And then the moment you get married, move out and never speak to them again and expect your marriage to work. But yet somehow in business and entrepreneurship, that's how people were taught to do it without realizing the fallout on the back end, right? And you know, I said this probably five years ago, Jonah Berger wrote an incredible book called Contagious. And I think he wrote it in 18 or 19. But at that time, over 86% of marketing was word of mouth. Mm. And what dictated what they said was based on their experience. And when you think about that, well, you're like, oh, and I, one of the things I say is that if you don't tell them what to say, you won't like what they say. Mm. And that simply comes from the intentionality of having this. And so when I think about that, marketing in its, in its essence, like how I define marketing is a two-way value-based long-term relationship, right? Because regardless of transaction, regardless of product, regardless of service, there's a human being that's making an emotional-based decision. Mm -hmm. And that human being is what we're building a relationship with. And whether you realize this or not, when you're in the game of business, you're building sometimes hundreds of thousands of monogamous relationships at scale. And when you take the relationship as the priority and not the transaction, well, human beings only need three things. They need to feel seen, heard, and respected. And once that happens, you have a solid baseline and deep endowment to a relationship agnostic of transaction, which actually increases their ability to do the work to get the result, to ask for help because there's a solid foundation which it's been built upon. And so for me, when I think about like, oh, we have this new offer or this new lead magnet, the first thing I do is like, okay, cool. Lead magnet's great, but how can I ensure that people get results with it? And I'll spend an hour mapping out the customer journey and we're all like, yeah, well, when that's done, my marketing's handled because I just turn it around and tell the world what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then now all of a sudden, instead of the transaction being the end state, right? Because one of the analogies that I give is that a lot of people are out here selling bridges, right? And they're like, here's the best bridge in the world. Here's the best bridge in the world. But you have to realize that your product or service isn't the solution. It's a bridge to the solution, right? And so nobody is out here like, oh, I'm going to buy this supplement because I want to lose 10 pounds. The supplement is my end all be all. No, the supplement is a tool to help them achieve the goal. And if mm -hmm. all you do is focus on the tool, well, then all you have is features and benefits and one night stands for lack of better terms. But yeah. when you focus on the after state and you realize that that's just one of 10 tools that could get them there, well, they have endowment and a relationship regardless of the product. So even if the product doesn't work or they want something different, they don't go shopping somewhere else. They're like, no, 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 I'll try something else. And because it's founded on a relationship. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, it's so common to see, especially you know, in, in the world that we live in of, of working with consultants and kind of the whole consulting industry that there's so much focus placed on, on acquisition or when people think about like, what's the best way to grow my business? The, the default, the status quo is oh, I have to get more leads, you know, more clients, build a pipeline and all that's important, but, For sure. but all the data points to that the best source of new business is your existing clients or it's people oh, that, exactly. that, you know, that they know it's the referrals, the introduction, just doing great work and creating that that word of mouth. So it's very interesting to, to see that that's not where people, where most people put their, their focus. And the example that you mentioned, George, of just a lead magnet. So for those that aren't familiar, right, a, a lead magnet might be somebody comes to your website, you offer them a free PDF or a video or something along those lines. You give something of a value away for value. free in exchange for them giving you their name or, or email address. And, and this is so accurate. And I know that we are also at times, um, you know, probably in the wrong around this, but it's like, yeah, let's offer something of value. And so we, we give people access to a book or a video, something of that, of that nature. But we don't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make sure that they take what we just offer them and actually have the highest chances of implementing that or benefiting from it and actually seeing the result that they want. Because what they want is not just the PDF. They want the outcome that the PDF will give them. Yeah. So how can we create that, that journey or that experience? That's really what I'm hearing you say. Yeah. And I think it should be a, a light bulb moment for many listeners right now, maybe, maybe you'll join us because probably most of us are guilty of, of not putting that level of thought into the equation. Yeah. And, and, and I have a note on that too, right? Like one of the things, like I said this a couple months ago and someone's like, Oh, and I was like, all of you are out here fishing and I'm trying to stop the fish from jumping in my boat. 
right? Mm -hmm. Because like at the end of the day, we have to understand that if somebody is coming into our world, like if we own a business, we have a product, we have a service, they're not coming into our world like, oh, our life is great and everything's working. They're like, I want to change something. And no matter what, whether that's they give us their email, they buy our product, what they're looking for is a result. And everybody focuses so much time and energy on the less than 1% of people that say yes, they miss the other 99% of people that are only one step away from being a guest without having to quote unquote sell. Mm. But what typically would tilt somebody from, okay, I don't feel safe to make this purchase. I don't know if this is going to work for me to a hell yes. Well, it's giving them a taste and a tangible result, which actually moves them closer to their goal. But we're the byproduct that got them there. And so naturally they're like, oh, if this is what it was like for free, can you imagine what it's like if I pay? And it changes the paradigm from like, I have to go sell to my job is to enroll people into a journey that gets them one step closer to their vision. If that involves a credit card, great. If it involves an email, great. If it involves just a social media post, great. But if I understand that in, in simplicity that I'm Jack and Jill and my job is to lay out breadcrumbs that just help people get one step closer, well, the game gets really easy because if you think in the lens and even in this and like... I'm a very high level consultant, but then on the other lens, I turn around and give it all away for free on my podcast. And I was like, I don't understand why people pay you the absorbent amount of money they do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, the information's the same. It's the journey that I designed to help them get the best results and mm -hmm. implement it in, right? But what people focus on is they focus on that 1%. I need more buyers. I need more emails, right? And what they don't realize is that if I took a thousand people that came into your ecosystem and I said, hey, how many of you thousand people had a positive experience and felt better when you left? Only literally 10 hands would go up and it would be the 1% of buyers because what happens in most businesses when people don't buy? We move on to the next, but yet we still invested the time and energy to tell them that we had a solution and we wanted a relationship with them. But the moment they didn't buy, they became transactional trash and we got rid of them. And then mm -hmm. I'm like, how many of you people had less than positive experience? And then 990 hands go up. And then when you understand marketing and 86% of word of mouth marketing and eight to 10 brand recommendations or non-recommendations in a 60 second conversation, you realize that you've been creating enemies of your brand as a byproduct of only focusing on the 1%. But instead of everybody having a bad experience, let's say somebody fills out an application to work with you and they're not a good fit. Amazing. It doesn't mean you throw them back in the ocean. Like, hey, you're not a good fit for our program or consulting. But when I heard you say this, I think this would be valuable. Here's a 30 minute video that I think you should use and implement and put into practice that will help you with boom, boom, boom. And when you get to a point of here, call me back. Well, now all of a sudden, I'm turning 990 no's to at minimum neutral and at best neutrals to yeses. And then those are the people that are spreading the message and engaging on my social because I was willing to go one step further and understand that there's a human, not a number, right? And, and one of my marketing laws is that everybody feels seen, heard, respected, or valued, whether they give you their credit card or not. And I was like, George, how do you get these million dollar deals and you don't do anything? I'm like, oh, well, that's Tammy. And Tammy emailed me four years ago and said she couldn't afford to pay me. So I gave her the course for free. And then now Tammy works for a startup and they needed my help. And they called me and paid me 200 grand. And they're like, what? And I was like, it's not my job to control the ripple. It's my job to ensure that the ripple can happen and that it happens in a lens in which I'm proud of that. And so I think the other part of customer journey that's so important is that a customer journey is not predicated on a transaction. Every time somebody sees you, they hear you, they see you on a podcast, they see you on social, they're on your email. That's all a part of a customer journey. And we would never have a brick and mortar business and be like, you can only come in the store if you pre-commit to buying. I won't talk to you unless you give me your credit card. But yet, it tends to be the way in which people do business online. And they're always like, George, how were you able to double my business in a week? I'm like, because you were trying to find the 1% and I built a relationship with the 99. And the moment I was able to build a relationship with them by acknowledging them, by seeing them, by answering their questions, guess what they did? They felt subconsciously safe enough based on that experience to whip out their credit card and we just doubled your business. But it requires that we look at the ecosystem as a whole and realize that in, and sorry, I'm on a tangent, but I'm going to give it away anyways. There's, there's only four things that people can do when they come into your world, right? I call these my four paths to the pier, right? 
And any given day, somebody can come into my world and they can leave. They can come into my world and learn more. They can come in and opt in or they can come in and buy. And they're all equally important. The only difference is the amount of touch points that they need to collect evidence to feel safe that this is the right decision. But how I make them feel at every step of that journey predicates the success that I'm going to have in that ripple. And people are like, oh, well, they bounced. And I'm like, so what that they bounce? They still spent 33 seconds on your website playing the field. What matters is that when they see you again, you're consistent and congruent to that experience they had. And that might be the tilt that moves them in. And most people only focus on the people that are going to buy and they miss 99% of the pie that basically guarantees you success that you couldn't even tangibly measure. And so that's it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just can't help but think what what you're describing right now is almost like a reverse Pareto principle, right? So it's like the 80, yep. 20, but you're actually talking about the 20, 80. I um, am. And, and so that's, that's very different from what most people tend to, to think about. Now, you, get, you gave a really great example of somebody, let's say, coming to a website, filling an application to join a program or whatever it might be, right? Most people tend to put the folks on either you're a fit or you're not. If you're not a fit, I'm not going to spend much time with you, right? That's kind of a, a very common mindset. Um, so you, you kind of gave a great, great example around that. What I'm wondering is, uh, so this podcast, the Consulting Success Podcast is all about featuring successful consultants like yourself, but our, our listeners are consultants. And uh, in the field of professional services, Right. Many of the dream clients, the ideal clients, the consultants are going after are executives in organizations. So they're not active on, let's say, Instagram or TikTok or uh, you know, social channels as much. They're not necessarily like the CEO of a large organization is probably not, you know, searching on Google and just clicking on ads and making a buy decision based on that. So how do you feel? And if at all, does the this this kind of approach, the mindset around customer journey? What might be an example of applying kind of this best practice and this kind of this framework and approach to more of a professional services yeah. setting with a more you know seasoned or just kind of a decision maker that's making a, a bigger decision than just somebody uh, you know buying a course online? Yeah, I, and I love this question. So it is one hundred percent the most powerful place for this to read. Like one of the reasons that I became one of the highest paid digital marketing consultants in under a year, by the way. I didn't even know consulting was a thing. And then my buddy is like, you should consult. And then 20 people in the room of this talk I gave were like, we'll hire you. And then literally a year later, I'm working with billion dollar brands and getting paid six figures a day in a matter of 11 months, no models, no nothing. And when I think back about what the secret was, is the secret that was that I built relationships agnostic of transaction. Mm. I didn't care if you paid me or not. I cared that I helped. And in my world, I quite frankly, hate losing. I hate losing. And so I built models that guarantee me to win because at the end of the day, a lot of people lose this game because they go straight for the close at the bar. They're like, Hey, I, I want to take you on a date. I want to take you home. And I'm like, have we missed flirting and courting and conversing and common ground? Right. And you have to realize that a lot of these dream clients that people are going after they're getting transacted with every day. They're getting pitched, they're getting offers and they're living in this transaction world. And the moment you show up as a human, you create equal ground that's endowed on a relationship agnostic of the transaction, right? So perfect example, I'll give a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I gave a keynote, right? One of my first ever keynotes and the CEO of Men's Health, a Rodale came up to me and she's like, I want your help. And I was like, okay. And she's like, how much do I pay you? I'm like, I don't know. I'll just do it for free. And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah, how's this? I'll come and help you for four days. And if at the end of it, it's worth it, you can write me a check. And she's like, you're psycho. I'm like, yeah, but I don't know if I can help you. I was honest about it, right? Flew out to Pennsylvania, spent four days with the whole team of men's health, women's health prevention, boom, boom, boom. Had like 70 people in a room for four days. And then I finished and they wrote me a check a couple of weeks later. And she said, I saved the company. And I literally make it almost impossible to pay me. Like, Michael, if you call me, you're like, hey, man, I have a question about my model and consulting. I'm like, dope. You're like, what's it going to take? I'm like, a Zoom link? Like, let's go, right? I'm like, let's get on Zoom. Let's help it. And one of my principles that I live by is that in order for me to win, you have to win first, which mm. requires that I build a relationship and that I understand where you are and who you are. And so in the world of professional services, like consulting, 
they're not hanging out anywhere but LinkedIn and I'm banned for LinkedIn for life. And I'm so happy about that because I hate that stupid platform anyways. Um, but they're all done for relationships, either networking events, you're at similar events, you're speaking to them and boom, boom, boom. And we've all been there. You give a talk, somebody comes up and they're in one or two buckets. They either want the answers in the transaction or they want to connect with you as a person. And which mm -hmm. ones do we remember? We remember the ones that wanted to connect with us as a person that didn't make us feel like a transaction machine, right? And so you have to understand when you're finding these things, the greatest weapon that you have in your arsenal is a relationship, not the transaction, right? And what I'm constantly looking for is ways that I can help. Book recommendations, introductions I can make, pieces of knowledge or tidbits. And I make it almost impossible to even know you can pay me because I'm so focused on building a relationship because I actually just want the relationship. I love helping people. Mm -hmm. Just so happens that when you help somebody and then eight months later, they're like, hey, here's a point in my $100 million company. I'm like, for what? They're like, just as a thank you. I'm like, oh, I'll take that deal all day, right? But if I went in like, oh, give me a point in your company and then I'll give you this, 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 no. Every time he called me, I picked up the phone. I'm like, oh no, I would do this. No, let me jump on with your team. Let me help them with this. Let me do boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, you got a $20 million payday. I was like, yeah, I earned the $20 million payday because that wasn't on my radar. The relationship was on my radar. So George, I got, so, just go sorry to interrupt, but I, I have to play the devil's advocate for a moment because I know I know people are going to be like listening to you right now going, well, okay, that, that makes sense. Like I, I can see that you are of an abundance mindset uh, you are providing as much value as you can, but how, how do you do that when you get busy, right? So the, take the consultant, they are the founder, they're running, they may have a team, they may not have a team. Uh, if they just say yes to all the opportunities that, that kind of come around them, and if they're just giving, 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 how do they actually have any time to yep. to make money, to build the business? So walk me I through how that. you think it. I love it. It makes my heart happy, right? So first, like you have to understand, like if you're a consultant listening to this, all you are is a professional relationship manager. That's all you are, right? All the rest of it takes you out of your power. If you're in your email, you're losing. If you're writing models, you're losing. If you're in the bullshit mundane calls, you're losing. Your job as a consultant is to be a master of relationships. But yet most of them live in this world of transaction, right? Mm -hmm. And so my lens is easy. I use the term that I coined containers, right? I build containers on everything, right? And the way that I do it is I am a yes to everybody. I will give everybody 30 minutes of my time for free. If that's video messages back and forth, if that's answering emails, it's whatever. But I'm not saying don't run the core functions of your business, right? So let me collapse this into customer journey, right? When I teach customer journey, one of the most important things I teach is that you have to feed the children you have now before you can adopt any new ones. And the amount of people listening to this right now who are only focused on getting more clients, but yet the ones they have are getting under-delivered is blowing my mind. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. If I went into every one of your businesses and I was like, hey, you have a hundred clients, I'm going to get on a Zoom call with every single one of them. And I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. How happy are you right now? How fulfilled do you feel? Do you feel seen and heard? Are you getting the results that you want, right? Most of their answers are going to be no. And then they're going to tell you exactly what they would need to feel a hell yes to then recommend you to other people, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to focus on the children that you have first and make sure that they're getting the results and you're fully fulfilling what that promise was. Once you have that information, you have the cheat codes to every other relationship that exists. And then you move from the people that are in to the people that are almost in. You have a relationship with them. They've showed interest. They're, they're a part of your world. They've shown some stuff. And then instead of trying to close them, you build a relationship with them. And you're like, okay, cool. What can I do? You're like, hey, fuck it. I've been on calls with you three times. All right. You know what? Fine. I would rather do this. I've asked enough. And there's three things that are bothering me about your business. Would you mind if we just jumped on Zoom and I mapped them out for you so you guys can do them and get the results? Because even if we don't work together, I want to know that I improved upon your silence. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hell yeah. Nobody ever says no to that, by the way, just for the record. Um, and then you're there. But then once those buckets are full, then you get into the acquisition bucket of where am I going to develop and build these new relationships? And when you build those relationships, it requires that you be a master of your time and a master of relationships, right? So I'll give an example. Uh, I gave a keynote uh, at a big event in Austin. Uh, Ezra Firestone was speaking. Gary Vaynerchuk was speaking. Everybody was speaking and I was speaking. And what does everybody at that conference have? They have a back table, right? Oh, if you want more, go to my back table. If you want more, go to my back table. I walked up and on stage and the first thing I said is like, I will never have a back fucking table and I'm the only speaker that wasn't paid to be here because I'm only here to help. 
So I'm going to give you an hour talk on customer journey and scaling your business. And I will be here for the next two days. And I won't leave until I've answered every one of your questions. That's it. Then I gave the whole talk. And then I answered questions for about 14 hours, right? But I knew when somebody came to ask me questions that they were going to go in one of two buckets. Bucket one is I could help them on the spot and give them some advice. And bucket two is I could help them, but I would need more information, right? So mm -hmm. bucket one, I answered every question. Bucket two, I was like, all right, listen, I can help you with this and I'll give you 30 minutes of my time for free, but I need you to write me an email, use this exact subject line and send me this information. If you do not use this subject line, I will delete your email. Because mm -hmm. if you can't listen to me enough to write that subject line, nothing I share with you is going to help you in your business anyways. Mm -hmm. And so of the, that day, I got 51 emails. It took me about 30 days. I responded to all of them. I made Loom videos. I did blank. I gave everybody about 15 to 20 minutes. And of the 51 or 52 emails, 43 of them closed. And it was $2 million in revenue off a free keynote that I wasn't paid for, not because I sold, but because I had a container about where I choose to spend my time and knowing how that moves the needle in my business. And I told them like, you don't have to pay me, do this, this, this. And like, okay, cool. One of them implemented what I did, didn't talk to me for eight months. I didn't hear a word. And then I got an email with a subject line that said, when can you come to Chicago? I need your routing and checking information to wire you this six figures. And I need to know what day you can come to Chicago. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, it worked. We want more, right? My job isn't to control that. My job is to control myself and to mm -hmm. know where I spend my time and what moves the needle. And in my world, relationships move the needle, right? And I live in the world of executives. I have billion dollar business partners. Like I'm, I'm, I own companies with some celebrity entrepreneurs and things like that. And they always never understand me. They're like, you'll go to dinner and we won't talk about business once. I'm like, no, I want to know your kids. I want to know your pets. I want to know your wife. And then they're like, and then you send us custom dog treats for my dog Fido. Like, who are you? But then six months later, when something pops up, who do you think they pick up the phone and call? Mm -hmm. Me. Not because I'm the best customer journey guy or the best marketing guy, which I am. But because I don't care about that stuff, I care about you. Because what I understand is that your business might change tomorrow. You might close it and launch a new one. You might change your offer. You might change your market. But if all I am is the expert in that area and there's no relationship, then I'm just transactional and I'm nothing than a high-end prostitute. And I don't want that because it doesn't help me, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's about mastering my time. And I'm not saying don't make money in your business. Don't do whatever. But I think a lot of people fall into this trap of, I need more, more, more when all the more they need is already inside their business. And right. they're like, oh yeah, my customers are happy. I'm like, great, let's talk about your team. This last time you got on a call with every one of your team members and asked them what you needed to fill their bucket. Mm -hmm. How was their bucket? How are they full? Are they embodying what you teach? Do they feel the same way? And you're like, oh crap. I'm like, there's always a hole. Right. And when you solve it from the inside, everything on the outside gets easy because when the inside of a company is aligned, then everything that gets transmuted on the outside gets reflected and people want to be a part of it, right? But everybody falls into this trap, myself included for years of like, nope, I need more people on the front. I need more revenue. There's only seven people in here. And I'm like, no, no, no. I need to blow these seven people out of the water. And once I've done that, then I can take that energy and direct it to where there's something else. And so I love devil's advocates here, but no matter which way you slice it, at the end of the day, a human being makes a decision, not a mm -hmm. robot, not a transaction, not an AI. No AI is putting in that credit card and no AI is making the decision to work with you. A human being is making the decision to work with you. And one of their filters is how safe they feel and how untransacted they feel with, knowing that you are so confident in what you do and how you do it, that you don't have to sell yourself. How you show up in the world is what sells them everything they need to know. And mm -hmm. one of the things I say to people all the time, and I say this very directly, is that your client's results will tell them everything they need to know about you. Not what you say, not what you've done, but the results that they achieve in their life. And so, yes, if I am at a conference and you and I happen to be speaking together and people are coming up, like, how can I work with them? Like, you can't. And they're like, why? I'm like, because I don't know if I can help you yet. Mm -hmm. Just based on what I stayed up here. I'm like, what's your business? What's your thing? And I'm looking for ways to help. And right. I focus on having them win first, because then at that point, if somebody comes to me for a piece of advice and I give them an answer in 10 minutes that changes the trajectory of their business, there's only one person they can hire in six months. Mm -hmm. No matter which way they slice it, their subconscious has already made the decision. That's how endowment works. That's how human 
psychology works and they're going to be like, oh crap, I got to call George. I got to call George. I got to call George. Right. And so I, I get the question and it's not an advocation of our responsibility to drive our company and to drive our team, but it's to really focus on what moves the needle in those areas. And the reason I say this is because I didn't used to be this way. I'd go to an event and I'd be hanging out with billionaires and celebrities. And the first thing I would do is like, hey man, nice to meet you. Here's what I do. Here's what I do. Like boom, boom, boom. And then they never talk to me again, right? And then I changed it to like, let me connect as a human. So let, let me, me just jump in for one sec, George, because that was actually a question I wanted to, um, to hear from you on is why the change or like, where does this mindset come from? So now, you know, you've shared that this is, you weren't always this way. You didn't always approach things in this way. What happened in your life? You know, what was that light that you saw? What caused you to, to shift how you approach conversations and just the mindset of full on abundance? Yeah, man. Um, I lost everything. I lost it all. Uh, millions down the drain. My wife left me. Uh, she was eight months pregnant. We were like three weeks away from bankruptcy. My friends wouldn't talk to me anymore because I was just a toxic transactional human. Mm -hmm. And I was masking it as I'm here to help. But it was impossible to help when I was agendized because I hadn't done my own work. Like I mm -hmm. wasn't coming from a place of like, I want to help. I was coming from a place of you're meeting my empty holes and wounds and needs that I won't address on my own. And so even though I had every intention of being transformational, for lack of better terms, I was transactional because everything was fitting a narrative. I was getting all my edification from business. I was deriving my identity based on the results I created and I lost it all. And I didn't lose it all once. I lost it all three times. Mm -hmm. And it was finally, and I'm that type of guy that like, if the universe smacks me in the face once, I won't listen. Twice, I won't listen. And third time, I'm like, oh, I should probably listen. But, you know, like that's that's been the the path of my life. And every time I lost it all, what I was reminded of is there was always this core group of five to six people that were there for me no matter what, no matter what results I had or no matter how I showed up or even how big of an asshole I was. And then I was like, oh, I've been missing the secret the whole time that the business doesn't matter. The results don't matter. The strategies don't matter. It's the people that matter mm. because at the end of the day, they're the ones that regardless of the business or where they are, what results are coming are the ones that are going to be there. And I was like, but I haven't been building relationships with anybody. I've been was building that, transactions. When was that scary for you to, once you saw that, because and there, I'll just put, put a bit of context behind the question. Um, once you make that decision that I'm not going to focus on generating you know, revenue or profit as quickly. So the focus is not just about transactions. The focus is on relationships. Well, relationships in most cases, right? It's it's a longer term mindset. It could take, as you mentioned, in some cases, many months or years in order for somebody to first have that conversation with you and then actually write you a check. So at that time, you know, in your words, you kind of lost everything. Now you've made this, this uh, decision to shift focus more to long-term, more to relationships, but you still got to eat. So how how did you kind of deal with that? How did you approach that? What was the mindset like once you yeah. made that decision? It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, it was scary as shit and it still is to this day uh, because it requires a lot of trust, but there's also many people that you'll walk up to in a bar or on an airplane and you become instant best friends. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't give enough credence to how fast relationships work. Right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily that I just wanted to build relationships with everybody. It was that I wanted to add value first. And that was one of the biggest distinctions. And so, yes, the fear was like, I'm not going to get paid. This isn't going to work. But you know, this magical thing happens when you add value in somebody's life. Uh, things happen really fast, mm. right? And so instead of this lens of like, oh, I can't wait to get on this sales call. I can't wait to close this. I can't wait to teach the model. And, you know, boom, 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 went to, I'm just going to help. And then instead of getting on a call and pitching the model and where the holes were in their business, I'm like, hey, I already did an audit of your whole business. Uh, this one hole is driving me nuts. Can I just fix it for you right now? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, no, no, seriously, like no agenda, hit record, get your team on the call. And then boom, 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 boom. And they're like, holy moly. And I realized that it was one of the best sales strategies in the world because rather than sitting there and like pontificating about all these things, I was like, nope, here you go. Here you go. And in that world, I can't lose because the worst thing that happens is that I get on a call with somebody and I fix their business and it works and they don't need to hire me. Great. That is the best thing that could ever happen because they are going to remember who did it and they're going to tell everybody who did it. Mm -hmm. Second thing is I get on the call, they implement it and they're like, oh, we want more of this. Or third thing is they're like, we can't implement this without you. Can you please help? Yeah. 
but there's no way to lose that game. And it really just comes down to practice, right? And that doesn't mean that like I wasn't working on closing deals or finding them, but I was just changing the way in which I approach them. And I still do this to this day. Like to this day, I'm getting on a flight tomorrow where I had a buddy call me and he's like, hey man, I really need your help to take this company to a hundred million. And I was like, he's like, how much is it going to cost me? I'm like a plane ticket. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah. And I went out for four days and I was like, I'm not done. I went back for another four days. Then I went back for another four days. And then I think on like the 16th day, he's like, this is insane. I have to pay you. I'm like, no, I'm not done yet. He's like, you're psycho. And I'm like, no, I'm committed. Like I feel it. I want the result until your team is. He's like, fine, just take part of the company. Right. But that's also me weighing and understanding the needle movers in my life and business and relationships are the biggest needle mover in my life, in my business, in my revenue, in my goals. And so I prioritize those over everything else. And my life and my day is designed around protecting relationships. Mm -hmm. When I record a piece of content, I don't do anything else with it. Like all I do is manage 200 DMs a day, get on phone calls, send Loom videos and check in with people. Like I, my job, like in my, in Mike McAllister's terms, like clockwork, like my big needle mover is relationship management. Mm -hmm. And that's all I do. And I ensure that I protect that over everything else. I don't do my calendar. I don't book my flights. I don't do distribution. I don't edit anything, right? Like I'm a ventriloquist puppet for my team. And then I handle relationships and that's what I protect over everything. And when I do that, it guarantees that everything moves forward. Like everyone's like, George, how come every time you do an event, you have literally $10,000 gift boxes for the pe people that paid you $500 for a ticket? I'm like, oh, I just pick up the phone. And they're like, what do you say? I'm like, hey, I'm doing an event. I need 10 grand a product. They're like, okay. And they're like, have they ever paid you? I'm like, no. And you're like, have you ever paid them? I'm like, no. I'm like, I just help them. And then that's how I get paid. And I think a lot of people mm -hmm. misinterpret the goals of a business. And when I think about commodities, revenue is the smallest one that I can get. The relationship is the biggest one, the referrals, the edification, the favors, the connections. That's what I'm really focused on monetizing. The revenue comes as a byproduct of all of those. But another mistake that I made is everything was focused on revenue. Well, how much can they pay me? And when can they pay me? And how quick can you get it? And it never led to sustainability. It was always like I was chasing my tail and chasing my tail. And now the biggest problem is I'm like, I love you. You can't pay me. I don't have the capacity or I don't want you to pay me. I can fix this in 30 minutes. They're like, yeah, yeah, but we want, I'm like, no, like mm -hmm. that, it changes the game. And it's still scary to this day, just for the record, for everybody listening, it's still scary for this day because no matter what my prices are, right? When I do consulting, it's typically like $50,000 a day and it's a minimum of three days. Like that's my base, right? But then the same day I'll get on a call with somebody and I'm like, that doesn't feel right. Hey, I'll do it for 10 grand. And they're like, you're psycho. I'm like, it feels best to me. And I make sure that it's in alignment with what I want to do. And I'm not romantic about what it looks like or how perfect it is, or does it fit into this bucket? And I'm willing to be in a relationship with people. And, and that's, I think, the most important part for me, because time is the greatest equalizer that we all have. Mm -hmm. I don't have any more than you. You don't have any more than me. But how I choose to use it is the busy, big, biggest determination of like what level of success that I get. And in this game, what I learned is that I thought I was spending my time on the things that move the needle, but instead I was hiding myself in the business of things that didn't move the needle because I was like afraid to connect and afraid to add value and afraid to be out there. Right. And so it's a big distinction, but it's a game. It's one that we have to play every day. George, what advice do you have for someone who is really resonating with this mindset and wants to just give and provide value? but they're maybe having trouble getting in front of the right people. Um, yeah. how, how can people think about that if, if they want to just offer value without condition, but they need to get in front of more of the, the ideal clients, the dream clients, what suggestions do you have for them so they can start having more of those conversations and building those relationships? Yeah, I love this question. And there's one important part about the term container, right? And I'm going to answer your question with this because I think it matters. Value without a preset expectation is a guaranteed loss, right? Mm -hmm. So like when I'm open with people, when I help people, right? Like if you were to call me out of the blue and you're like, hey man, Sony introduced us, I'd love to talk to you. I'm like, hey man, listen, 
I can give you 30 minutes of my time for free. And after that point, like we're going to have to change the relationship. I'm upfront about everything, right? I don't hide behind it. I don't try to bait and switch. I'm like, no. Or if I'm like, hey, man, I just love your energy. I love that you're a husband. I love what you do. I'll give you an hour, man. And then we'll see what happens after that. But I'm always open about it. I don't ever give or provide value with any ambiguity. I am mm. crystal clear. Right. And that's when it comes down to leadership. Like when, when we're in a, any relationship in our life, you're either leading or you're following as an entrepreneur, your job is to lead all of them, which means lead the expectations, lead the containers, lead the journey, because that's what dictates our authority and our ability to help people. So it's an important part. Like yeah. when somebody DMs me on Instagram, like, Hey man, uh, I'd love your free customer journey training. I'm like, amazing. Here it is. And when you're done with it, the next best thing for you to do is to either buy this course or come to an event. And what I'm doing is I'm setting the container that they don't think I'm going to coach them for free, but mm -hmm. I will sure as shit give you 90 minutes of insane value. And when you're done with it, I'm very clear on what your next steps are, right? So that's a big, important part, right? Yeah, great, great distinction. I appreciate you making that. Yeah, it's huge, right? Because when we think about the term container, they have a beginning and an end. It's mm -hmm. not a beginning and it's open forever, right? That's game over. And it just leads to overwhelm on our part too, because we have all these open loops, right? We have all this like unrest and the Zygarnik effect. And so then to answer your question about like, okay, I want to give, I want to get out. This is what I tell everybody, leverage what you already have. If you were to just sit down and scroll through your phone or your friends list on Facebook or your people you follow on Instagram, you could find a hundred people that need your help right now. Mm -hmm. if not more. And then the goal is to figure out how you can help them and help them, right? If it's a 10 minute loom video and be like, Hey man, I saw this thing. Like I still do this to this day. I had somebody follow me the other day with like 700 followers and I saw their caption and it bothered me. So I took 60 seconds and recorded a loom video. I'm like, Hey, listen, when you write these, do this, do this. And they were like, why would you give this to me? I'm like, why wouldn't I give this to you? Right. Mm -hmm. It took me 60 seconds. Right. Now I have a fan for life. And it's really about utilizing the opportunity that's around us. Getting in front of people, networking, getting in front of the right eyeballs is all about relationships. Right. That's all it is. But like I have an example with a very famous athlete that everybody would know, but out of respect, I won't say his name. And everyone's like, how did you get him to sponsor your event, promote your products, and then never ask for anything in return? And I was like, well, I found his email and I sent him a Loom video thanking him for being an incredible leader, uh, really proud of his work. And then him and his brothers making a big difference. And I just thanked him. And then he responded to my email and said, is there anything I can do to help you? I'm like, actually, I'd love it if you sponsored my event. And he's like, yeah, of course. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't rocket science. It was the intentionality and the willingness to do it, right? And I think that that's the most important part. It's like no different than thinking about if I'm at a conference with a thousand people, those are a thousand people that I could help. But if I sit in the corner with my thumb up my ass and I wait for every one of them to come talk to me, nothing is going to change. Mm -hmm. It's going to require that I'm intentional about connecting and asking questions and asking what you do and how I can help and then inserting a solution in that moment. But for whatever reason, people on the internet think it's some different world. It's the same thing. Who are three people that you can DM today to ask them a question that you can help answer? Because those three people are going to tell 30 people and then 60 people and then 90 people. And then you end up like me where you somehow magically just DM like the CMO, right? Because like somebody followed my podcast, I shot them a DM and they're like, you know, I'm the CMO of this nine figure company. I'm like, no, can I help you with anything? He's like, yeah, we'd love to hire you. I'm like, no, no, no let's get on a call. Right. But I can't hit the ball if I don't take a swing. And mm. so I live this way every day, like every day on Instagram. Whether we get 30 followers or 80 followers every day at night, I record one video every night and I send it to every single person who followed me and I thank them for following me and I ask them how I can help. And then every day that somebody engages with my, my social content on Instagram, I record another video and I DM them all at night and I say, hey, I know there's a lot of people you could engage with and I just want to say thanks for taking the time to comment. If you have any questions, shoot them my way and I'll record a podcast or do whatever. Whenever somebody adds me as a friend on Facebook, I don't approve all the friend requests. Once a week, I record a video and I say, thank you for the friend request. I don't believe in hoarding relationships. So I want to know how you found my slice of crazy. And most importantly, if there's anything I can do to help you, because I don't believe in hoarding relationships. And so let me know how I can help and my team and I will help. And I'm constantly hundreds of times a day asking people, how can I help? And you want to know what the beautiful part is? I don't have to do market research. 
I have 10 years of content in front of me that all I have to do is answer every one of these questions. And then they're like, can I pay you for this? Can I hire you for this? Can, can you speak on my stage? Can you come on my podcast? Just from simply leading with a question of instead of what can you buy for me to how can I help you? Mm -hmm. What can I support you with? And so it just requires effort, right? And I tell everybody listening to this, pick three areas every day with three simple things you can do and go do them out there. If you have a friend that's putting on an event, don't try to get paid as a fucking speaker. Call and be like, hey, bro, listen, can I just come for free and speak value into your room? Because you have a room full of entrepreneurs and I can teach them these three things for customer journey. Don't worry about it. I just want to come help. Find the opportunity and put it out there. Put it together, a Facebook group. Go on your Facebook and say, hey, I'm doing a Zoom training for 15 people for free for two hours. I'm going to break down these three things for free. Let me know if you're in. There's opportunity abound, but mm. we have to be willing to ask for it. And I think that that's one of the most important parts is that it requires that we take active choices. We don't passively wait for something to show up. I think mean, that's such a great point. You know, very often people are looking for like, what is the hack? What is the way to, to automate doing all this stuff? Cause they don't want to put in the time. Um, and what you're talking about is manual work. It doesn't quote unquote scale, but, it, and it may take longer up front, but in almost all cases, it, you're going to get the actual result that you desire a lot sooner than if you tried to automate something and you don't have that personal touch and you just keep taking longer and longer to see any result. Cause it's, it's not going to resonate with anybody. So I think that's a, a really great perspective and uh, way of implementing things. Can you imagine if you tried to automate the relationship with your wife? Yeah. I mean, well, she might be happier, but no. <laughs> no, but think about it. Like if you tried to automate every text message, every anniversary day, like you I'm, can't, right? I'm with you hundred percent. People who try to automate things on LinkedIn or all these other platforms. Um, listen, I, I understand where it comes from. It's you, you want to use technology because you think it'll help you to grow. It'll help you to be more efficient, more effective. That's, that's what the the media, the noise all around us is kind of hinting that we should do. But it's all about relationships. As you said, I'm a very big believer, you know, in this a previous consulting business that we had actually in Japan, we call it Kanke culture. Kanke is the Japanese word for relationships. So relationship culture, it's, it's all about that. And I think so often everybody's looking for the shortcut for just the way to speed things up. But often by doing that, you're, it's going to take you longer to get the actual result that you want. For sure. And I have a, I have a thing for everybody. I use automations. But the most important part about automating relationships is that it starts and ends with a human, mm. right? Like no joke. Like if anybody here wants to test me, shoot me a DM on Instagram and say, Hey man, I want your customer journey training. My Instagram is it's George Bryant, I T S G E O R G E B R Y A N T. You will not get an automation. You will get a message from me when you're like, Hey man, I want your CJ training. I'll send you a message like, Hey Mike, I'm stoked that you're interested I'm going to send it to you in a minute. Just make sure when you're done, it doesn't become shelf help. Implement it and tell me what you do with it. And then I hit the button and then the automation takes over. Here's the right. training, here's the video. And then if you ever respond, there's a human there. I do use automations in sure. my marriage. Like no joke, on January 1st, I use a greeting card service and I write out and have an artist hand draw all the big dates in my life for the year for my wife on our anniversary, the day that we met, the day my son was born, Mother's Day. But that is just the foundational baseline. And then I enhance on top of it, right? Because I'm like, oh, I'm a dude. I forget. It's going to pop up on my calendar the morning of, and then I'm going to have to, uh, right? And I think yeah. what, what determines the effectiveness of a automation is number one, the intentionality, and number two, the authenticity. Mm -hmm. So when I record those videos, I used to send a personal video every day. But I got to the point where I was doing 400 videos a day. And it only takes like 20 minutes because they're 14 seconds each, right? Mm -hmm. But then it was a little unsustainable. And so okay. now I record one and I'm like, hey, by the way, oh, you're one of 40 people getting this video because I can't personalize them anymore. But the moment I say it, it creates authentic trust because I'm being honest. Right. I'm not pretending that like this many chat bot is me or that this AI is me. I'm like, no, I even name it. I'm like, this is computer George, right? This is the smarter version of George, right? Like I, I make jokes about it. Because when that is mixed with the intentionality, they understand that I'm doing it because I have their best interest in mind, not because I'm trying to get them into a funnel or into somewhere else. And naturally as a byproduct, what do they all do? Hey man, I want to work with you. I want to learn how you do this. Like, how do you do relationships at scale, right? Like, you know, I'll, I'll give everybody a couple hacks too, because like, the, the, I don't know why, Michael, but this one blows everybody's mind. I don't know why, but this is probably like my number one relationship hack when it comes to meeting people, right? So 
Yeah. People meet people all the time, right? Let's say we go to a conference. I think the biggest mistake people make is they give out business cards. I don't mm -hmm. own a business card and I've never had one. Because if I want you to get a hold of me, I'm either going to give you my email or my phone number. I'm not going to give you a piece of trash that's going to get forgotten about, right? But you and I are at a conference, right? We bump into each other, we meet, and I'm like, oh man, I like this guy. I want to connect with him. You're like, yeah, I'd love to come on a call. I'm like, cool. Do me a favor. Stand here for a second. I open my phone and I record a 20 second video. I'm like, hey, Mike, look, say hi. I'm like, I'm going to email this to both of us so we remember how we met and why we met. And I'm going to email it to you right now. And then I open my email, I type in your email, and then I hit send. And I send it in that moment's notice. And then when I walk away, I write two more emails and I schedule them seven days into the future and 30 days into the future. It's like, hey man, just check it in. Can't wait to connect. And it's set up. So if you respond to that first email, they get deleted. If you don't, then you get the next one and the next one. And then I don't have to think about it because if you don't respond, there was never a relationship there for me to chase. Sure. But I made sure that I didn't get lost in the shuffle or lost or whatever. So someone's like, so what do you do when you write emails? I'm like, oh, if I'm responding to an email for somebody I love, I'll respond to the email because they email me and then I'll schedule one 30 days later and 60 days later, the moment I hit reply. And then that goes out 30 days and 60 days later. And they're like, why is your inbox constantly flooded with people that want you on their podcast or to speak? And I was like, because I understand that attention is the number one traded commodity and everybody's competing for it. And so rather than be like, okay, who can I call today? Who can I email? The moment I'm at the inflection point, I just pre-handle it and I keep them evergreen as check-ins. And then I send those things out. Single-handedly, probably responsible for like $50 million in business, just that alone, because I become a social trigger at that point. And what might happen is like 30 days later, you get that email like, fuck, I never responded to George and customer journey is my biggest problem right now. I'm an asshole. And then you'll be like, hey man, I'm so sorry I ignored you. I'm like, bro, I love you. I'm just glad you got back to me. Let's jump on a call. And all of a sudden the deal is closed just based on the humanity rather than the transaction, right? And so like, it's the intentionality. And one of the things that I say to people, consultants specifically, is you'll never be able to compete on width, but you're guaranteed to win on depth. Mm. And depth means that you're willing to go one step further than the next person to create that relationship. And whether that's, I heard you say something about your dog or your wife, and when I wrote that second email, I'm like, hey, man, how's the automating your wife doing? I know she thought it would be better, but is it working? And all of a sudden, you're like, this guy knows me. And I do because I was intentional about listening. I truly made it about you. And as a byproduct, I only win. I'm in alignment. I'm there because I really believe that. I really live that way, right? But I can take that and I can be intentional about it to help mitigate relationships or to help navigate relationships. Like, even my old mastermind that's been long and gone and closed, they have an offboarding customer journey and they all hated me for it because they would leave the mastermind after our time was up or whatever. And then 30 days later, I'd send them a handwritten card in the mail. And then 30 days later, I'd mail them all their swag, like their name placard. And then they'd be like, all right, man, can I just join again? Like, I miss you guys. I'm like, no, that's not why I'm doing this. But I just, it's the intentionality that makes the difference. And at the end of the day, especially when you're talking about consulting at a high level, the way that you lose that game is when it's all based on features and benefits. It's a guaranteed loss because it's just a transaction at scale. And it almost creates an unrealistic and unmeetable expectation because it's all transactional. But when it becomes human and relationships and I can promise the moon and it doesn't happen, they're not worried about me quitting. I'm like, no, we'll go back to work. Nope, we'll go back to work, right? Because there's a deeper relationship that's predicated on a connection, not the transaction. And it's how you get five-figure deals, six-figure deals. And in my case, some seven and eight-figure deals by spitting on my hand with a handshake. Like I've never signed a contract. I've only signed two NDAs in my entire career. I've never signed a non-compete. Everything's based on, oh, sweet, you want to do it? Yeah, let's go, right? Has it bit me in the ass? A few times, but my wife's incredible. She's like, how are you going to sleep tonight? I'm like, I'm going to sleep great. I wouldn't change anything about how I showed up. She's like, great, go to bed, wake up. It's another new day tomorrow. It has nothing to do with me, right? And I think it's an important part to understand that, you know, the faster everybody realizes that humanity and relationships are the secret to every one of these games, the faster the game is winnable. There's abundance for everybody. It's not even about having an abundant mindset. It's just about really understanding what moves the needle in your business. If you're a consultant that charges, you know, 15K for consulting, you have 10 clients, 150 grand. You have 100 clients. It's $1.5 million a year 
Why are you trying to run ads to find thousands of people when you're barely fulfilling on the 10 that you have? Because if you fulfill on the 10 that you have and you blow their mind, you know what they do? They give you more money. Mm -hmm. And then they tell their friends about you because they're friends. They want you to help them after they got a result because it helps edify them. And it's really about focusing on what genuinely matters in my opinion. So that's yeah. my rant on that. There we go. Well, George, there's so much more that we could dive into. <laughs> Uh, I feel like we're just literally scratching the surface. Uh, I have a bunch of questions we didn't get to, but we're going to, we can do, we can do a round two, man. I'm, I'll yeah. do round three, round four, round five. I will do this all day. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not surprised uh, based on everything we've been talking about that, that, that that's your response. So uh, I know you mentioned where people can find you on Instagram. Is there anywhere else that you want to send yeah. people to learn more about, you know, what you're up to and uh, yeah. Work. Yeah, for sure. I'm making pink cool again. My website is the pinkest website you'll ever see. It's mindofgeorge.com. Um, but uh, I give away everything for free. Like anything that people pay me for is for free on my podcast. I've given it all away. I have a free customer journey training, free email course. Like I have a lot of free stuff because I genuinely believe that you should win first. And so go to mindofgeorge.com. You'll see everything there. The podcast is there. The customer journey training is there. Or because I did say this earlier, if you have any questions, if you have a specific, shoot me a DM on Instagram, I will personally respond and answer your question. Uh, but those are the best two places to go. The podcast for sure, uh, it should be required listening in my opinion, given the value of stuff I give away. Uh, but I will say this for everybody listening. Um, the most important part of any of this working is that you take one thing and you implement it. Don't try to plan 20 things and do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. Shelf help is just mental masturbation. It's not gonna change anything. You got to pick one thing and you got to put it in, whether it's, you know, uh, changing the way you write an email, whether it's sending one more follow up, whether like my favorite hack is when I email people, I record a loom video instead of writing an email and I embed the GIF in the email. So every email I send gets a video of me in it and I'm immediately human. Right. But no matter what it is, whether you heard it on this podcast, you see it on my website or you hear it on my podcast, the most important thing you can do is practice it, like mm -hmm. put it into practice and give it the ability to win because this is a long game, but it also has short-term wins associated with it. And the yeah. faster you practice and play it, the faster you're going to figure that out. And so I would just, I would say that. So mindofgeorge.com. Uh, and then my Instagram is it's George Bryant. There we go. George, thanks so much for coming on and uh, hanging out for a little bit. Appreciate it. Thanks uh, for having me, man. I'm stoked. Yeah.